Hi everybody, Pastor Mike here. Thanks for being here. Welcome to Crossroads Church at Montgomery, our online worship service. Before we get into our worship and into the Word, I want to just kind of review a couple of announcements. Uh, remember again that children's ministry is going to happen right after the service, so if you've got kids, you get them ready to, you know, usher them in, and I think they're really going to be blessed. So will you, by the way. Really good stuff. And uh, uh, some of you have expressed interest in uh, being a part of the training for the three Chosen 300 ministry. Uh, as we go out, we're going to be trained so that we can go serve people, serve them food and minister to them. Uh, that uh, training was Tuesday, November 17th. If you missed it and you're interested in participating, just write us, let us know. We've recorded that and uh, we'll get you up to speed. And uh, if, you, if you want to be part of that, we'll, we'd, be loved, we'd love to add you to the team. Last week, I talked about our Thanksgiving plans. Uh, we said that our normal uh, Thanksgiving potluck uh, service was going to be canceled this year due to all of these health concerns. And uh, I was hoping that we could do something, maybe a little pumpkin pie or do some, something simple for those of you that feel safe coming out. But um, with the recent rise in cases, we were advised by the county health officials not to do something like that, and we're trying our best to abide by their concerns. So um, no big Thanksgiving plans for us this year, just like probably many others. Uh, it's a tough time, but we're going to get through it. We are hoping that we can still have our Christmas service, and that's when we're going to be welcoming the team from Piercing Word Ministries, a uh, group of young people. They, they, they kind of work out there near Sight and Sound. Some of them work at Sight and Sound. These are the people who have put entire books of the Bible, word for word, uh, into a drama at, that they'll play out. Well, they've come up with a Christmas program called Christmas Through the Ages, and it basically takes the text of Luke 2, and then it traces those words and those ideas through different ages in our, in our nation's history and how it continues to show up in our, our nation's celebration of Christmas. It's a really wonderful time. Uh, we're going to be doing that on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m., December 20th, the Sunday before Christmas. And uh, we still hope that we'll be able to do that live and in person. Um, we'll do it with social distancing and, you know, those kind of... Uh, cautions in place. And for those of you that aren't able to come, we, are, we will also be uh, showing a video production version of that same program. But we're really looking forward to that. And uh, I hope that we're going we're gonna to be getting some uh, advertising materials out to you soon. And, and we hope that you'll use them to invite someone to either watch along with you or to come to the service in person. And uh, perhaps someone who otherwise wouldn't make it to church will hear the gospel. That's our hope. Hey, uh, a new church directory is in the process of being created. Uh, Alicia Osborne has uh, agreed to compile this for us. Uh, it will be a digital directory, which means it'll be on your device. Uh, it, you can access it anywhere you go. Uh, you can even update your own information when, when you know you've changed an email address or you've changed a cell phone. You, you don't... You can change it yourself. It'll be easy to maintain. 
Uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that, but we're starting from scratch. So just because you were in the old one doesn't mean you will be included in the new one. If you'd like to be included in this directory, you need to write Alicia. Uh, her email address is uh, in the sermon notes. We've pasted it there. Or you can write info at Crossroads and uh, we'll get you in touch with her. Uh, by the way, if, if you need a good picture taken, she can see, even agree. She's a great photographer. She's agreed to even take your picture for the directory. Uh, so it might be a great opportunity to get a few good pictures and get into the new church directory. Well, that's all I've got. Uh, it's been a crazy week. Uh, we pray for our nation. We pray for uh, all of the tensions that exist uh, during this political transition and, and the divisions that exist in our culture. And I just want to remind you that our goal together as Christians is to agree that we can, we can disagree politically, but we're going to love unconditionally. And we're going to pray for opportunities to share the gospel and pray for the one thing that is the win for us, and that's unity. We're one. We're one nation. We're also one in the body of Christ, as a body of Christ. So I hope that you're having a chance to experience that more than the, the division. Well, I want to pray for us, and then um, we're going to worship, and Ben will lead us in worship. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for this chance to be together. Thank you that despite the distancing physically, we can connect like this. And it's a gift, and it makes us appreciate one another even more. I pray for every person listening, for those that are struggling, for those that are anxious, for those that feel isolated. I felt some of that this week. Lord, would you continue to teach us how to trust you, how to look to you, and how to grow in our faith through all of this. We've been learning that even though it feels like church isn't meeting, we've been hearing reports about how people are coming to find you and how we are uh, having a role, having an influence in people's lives. And we're so thankful for that. We just ask that you help us to be really good stewards of that. Now, before we get into the book of Galatians, as we worship together, I pray that your spirit would work in our spirit, that you would free us and that from us would come songs of joy and songs of adoration. Thank you for being so good to us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. We're reaching out to welcome you, God. Fill this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts with wonder and awe. Give us a greater glimpse of a never-changing God. Till all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus, every Story is found in you, found in you, yeah. Open wide our hearts now to yours. Every fear bow down to your love. We would see like never before. Give us a greater glimpse of a never changing God. Till all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every There is freedom In your presence We are made whole Cause all we want And all we need Is found in you Found in you Jesus Every victory Is 
is found in you, found in you. It's found in you, Jesus. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
Hey, so we're in the book of Galatians. The series is simply titled Freedom, but the title for this morning is Church of the Living Dead. Uh, everything's about zombies, and believe it or not, this is one of the passages in scriptures that almost talks about Christian zombies. See if you can spot it toward the end of the message. But before we get into it, I just want to ask, did you take me up on the challenge of reading through the book of Galatians during our study? So if you missed this week, okay, admit it, own it. And why don't you consider joining in this next week? There's six chapters in the book. It'll take you about four minutes or less to read that chapter. If you were to read one chapter a day, that takes you Monday through Saturday, take Sundays off. I wonder what changes God could make in us if we were all reading this book together as we study it. I'm convinced it could be profound. So I hope you'll do more than just listen to me. I hope you'll be reading it on your own. And hey, listen, I'd love to hear from you to find out that you're doing that. It's encouraging to hear that you're in the Word too. Maybe you have an insight. You saw something that you thought was great. Maybe you have a question. Send them in. I'd love to interact with you. Just text me, email me, whatever is easiest for you. Well, what we've said about the, this little letter from Paul uh, called to the, to the believers in Galatians, we've said that the basic message of Galatians is that we are saved by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law. Another way to put it is we're saved by what we believe, not by what we achieve. Now, last week, we started out by looking at how the churches in Galatia got started. We kind of went through all those passages. And after Paul had planted these churches, had preached and people responded in faith, he left, went back to Jerusalem. And then some other people came in. We call them Judaizers. They came in behind Paul to undercut his authority and to contaminate his message by adding requirements for salvation to faith in Christ. Their message was that, hey, believing in Jesus is important, but you need more than that. You need to also keep obeying the law. In fact, the best Christians, they would say, are Jewish Christians. So if you become a Jew and a Christian, that's perfect. So they were trying to undercut Paul. They were, they were saying, look, he, Paul doesn't have the credibility that you think. I'm not sure why you're listening to him. He's not really approved by the, by the home church, the, the big guys back in Jerusalem. And, and by the way, they would say, this message of Paul's, he's repealing the law of Moses. He's saying it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not needed anymore. And one important message I think that these Judaizers were bringing was that they would say, to repeal the law of Moses will result in more sin. People who follow this message are going to sin more. And you don't want to encourage sinful things, do you? Now remember, they were talking to primarily Gentile converts. People who were Gentiles, they worshipped Zeus, they worshipped uh, all kinds of other family gods, they would, they would see prostitutes in the temple, and, and I mean, weird things. They lived sinful lives, and now that they've come to faith, they were very sensitive to someone saying that they were going to go back to that sinful way of life. I remember one man, he, he came to faith, and uh, he was growing in his faith. He, he was helping us with the youth ministry where Cindy and I were working, and uh, we were planning an outreach for the kids. We were planning a beach night. You know, whole beach theme. And we brought sand in, we poured it in the gymnasium, and we were playing sand volleyball and, and doing all these act like beach type activities in the middle of Pennsylvania in the winter. But when he got there the night of the event, he was so angry. And he came up to me, he was angry because we were playing Beach Boys music. Now, what else were you going to play at a beach night, right? It's Beach Boys music. But he was livid, and he didn't understand why we didn't know how evil this was, what a bad influence this was. And to make a long story short, before he came to faith, he lived a really sinful life. And that Beach Boys music was kind of the theme. His whole life was about fast cars and girls and drinking and drugs, and, and that was the soundtrack to his life. And now he couldn't conceive of anything except that music being evil. And of course, everybody else heard it as like the cleanest, squeaky clean kind of music we could play. But for him, 
He was so sensitive to it because of his former way of life. Well, that's the way these Gentile co converts would have been. And now these Judaizers are saying, look, if you repeal the law of God, people are going to sin more. No wonder the Judaizers were getting traction with these Gentile converts. So, the outline of the book is that in chapters 1 and 2 of Galatians, Paul's going to address them undercutting his authority and, and this idea of the law. Into chapters 3 and 4, then, he's really going to explain what the purpose of the law really was. But um, we're going to start today in Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. I'm not going to take the time this morning to read it to you. It is printed in the sermon notes. You can read it for yourselves. But I want to summarize a little bit of what Paul says in this passage. Paul starts out by saying, look, um, if you want to talk about the law of God, the law of Moses, he says, I personally, I was a famous keeper of the law. Like he says, I was one of the best. But when Jesus called me, when he, when, when he appeared to me, I changed right away and I went right to work for him. He says, and once I started that, I didn't get my message, this message that I'm sharing, I didn't get it from anybody else, Jesus only. I didn't check with the big wheels down in Jerusalem. You know, the ones that the Judaizers were inferring that he didn't have their approval. And then he goes on, he's telling a little bit of the history. He says, after about three years, I went down to Jerusalem and I visited with Peter and James. And it was a nice visit. He says, they, we, we saw each other as comrades. He says, and then I, I kind of hit the road uh, sharing the gospel in unevangelized areas. And as I did that, nobody knew who I was. I was a nobody. I'm not trying to make myself famous. I was serving in obscurity. That's fine with me. He says, in fact, nobody knew me except they, heard, they had heard that this guy that used to persecute the church, now he's, he's preaching the gospel. He says, but they didn't even know who I was. Now, moving on then to chapter 2, what Paul basically says in chapter 2, he says, like, so here's the rest of the story here. You're saying that uh, I don't have the approval of the guys in Jerusalem and you're trying to undercut my authority. What he says is, after about 14 years of ministry, he and Barnabas took that gift, remember, we talked about that during the introduction. They took that money gift to the believers in Jerusalem. And uh, while they were there, um, remember they, he had heard they had, somebody had a, 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 the gift of prophecy. They had said there was going to be a famine and they knew that the Jews in Jerusalem, were, I mean the believers in Jerusalem were really going to struggle. And so they took this money gift down to them. And while he was there, he met with the church leaders, okay, the apostles. And he shared with them the message that he had been preaching. He says, I wanted to make sure I wasn't running in vain. Are we on the same page? And what he says is, those big wheels didn't see the need to add or correct anything in what I was preaching. And he says, in fact, they viewed what I was doing with the Gentiles as being parallel to what Peter was doing with the Jews. What he's saying is, they treated me like a peer. I was preaching the same message as they were. He says, in fact, Peter, James, and John extended to, uh, extended to us the right hand of Christian fellowship. Basically, they certified Paul. They said, you're on the same team, same message, we approve. In fact, he says, we even brought this young man, Titus, who was a Gentile and had come to faith. We brought him with us. And nobody even insisted that Titus be circumcised. Which, by the way, I guess Titus was pretty relieved to hear that, right? But the whole point was, it wasn't an issue. This whole thing of circumcision or table fellowship, eating with Gentiles, hanging out with Gentiles. None of that was a problem. He says, all they asked us to do was to remember the poor. Basically, keep bringing gifts like this. And Paul says, that's exactly what I intended to do. So he's defending his standing as the apostle. And he's saying, in one sense, uh, what do you mean they don't approve? Like, they certified me. They didn't correct a thing that I was saying. But in this next passage, it's a real awkward interaction. Starting in verse 11, he tells us something else that happens. He says, when Cephas came to, to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Now, let me, again, summarize this. Basically, what had happened is, uh, remember, Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch, and they're ministering, they're teaching, and uh, Peter came up from Jerusalem to kind of see how this ministry was going. And Peter 
saw all these Gentiles who had turned to Jesus, and they were part of the church, and, and they were fellowshipping and, and, and encouraging. He had a blast with them. They would have these big buffets, I'm guessing, and Peter was having pork chops and shrimp scampi and all the stuff that like the Jews wouldn't eat, but the Gentiles had no scruples. They had no laws to follow. He knew that what he was experiencing, this is Peter, was really the fulfillment of what God had shown him when in Acts chapter uh, 10 when he lowered that sheet and he showed all those kind of different foods and he said, eat, and Peter said, never. And he says, hey, don't call unclean what I've called clean. That all was foreshadowing exactly what he was experiencing. Now Gentiles are coming to faith. They don't have to act like Jews. They can just be believers. So isn't that great? Peter's having a blast. But then a, another group of people, conservative Jewish, these Judaizers, they came from Jerusalem. And once they arrived in Antioch, suddenly Peter started acting different. He, would, he passed on the shrimp scampi. And he started sitting with those Jewish guys and he wouldn't be seen sitting with Gentiles because that was, that was their big sensitivity. Now, it might have been that Peter started out simply trying to not use his liberty to cause these other Jewish brothers to stumble. But in verse 13, Paul says this. He says, but he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. He, Peter wasn't just trying to not offend them. He wanted them to think that he was still squeaky clean Jewish like they expected. So in verse 14, he says that the, the freed Jews, including Barnabas and others, people who knew that they were free from all those dietary laws and all those fellowshipping laws, well, they started following Peter's example and they got caught up in the same thing. All of a sudden, instead of being all together in one, all of a sudden now these Jews were were like withholding and stepping back and staying distant. You see, they were holding a double standard. Believing Gentiles don't need to live like Jews. But if judgmental Jews are watching, then I'm going to make them think I'm still living kosher. And that's a double standard. And it was influencing other believers. And so Paul in this passage, he says, I called Peter out publicly, right out in front of everybody. Now, as you read that passage, maybe you're going to struggle. I, I did. I thought to myself, wait a minute. In Matthew 18, Jesus taught that when we're going to confront another brother about sin, we should always do it privately first. And that is what he taught. But you see, this situation had already gone past private. Peter's behavior had already influenced other believers. It was too late. This wasn't something to be taken care of privately. And honestly, what we learn is when public leaders, including pastors, when we sin publicly, we often shouldn't get the privilege of being approached privately. If our sin is public, the correction probably should be public too. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, how do you feel about fellow believers being called out publicly for their sins? Yeah, I don't like it either, to be honest. Uh, we very much would like to live and let live. Okay? Nobody wants to be with those people pointing and judging and saying bad things. We, do, we just don't. It's really awkward, and I would like to avoid it. But this scripture, along with others, makes it really clear that there are times when leaders, all of us can make mistakes, but when our mistakes are so severe that they impact doctrine and they impact people's behavior, there is a time and a place to call them out publicly. By the way, does that only happen to bad leaders? Nah, I would say Peter was a pretty, pretty, pretty top-notch guy. See what this tells us? It can happen to any of us. Any of us can, can lose sight of, of an anchor to our faith and all of a sudden be acting in a way that is in contradiction with what we say we believe. And when that happens, we need to be challenged 
to live in a way that's consistent with what we say we believe. It was true of Peter, and it's true for you and me too. This is less about stated doctrine. It's more about what we infer by how we act. You know, we can say, oh, Jesus loves everybody, but then we act in a way that, like, we like some people better than others. And when we do that, somebody should probably come along and say, hey, I don't think you're walking the talk. And no one's going to want to hear that. And yet, we know from this passage and others, it's the right thing to do. So anyway, starting in verse 15, after Paul has confronted Peter, then he turns the discussion. That's not, not so much just about Peter anymore. Now it's about the bigger question about how are Gentiles saved and how do they have to act. In verse 15, he says, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles. Now, it's hard to tell whether Paul is still talking to Peter if he's, if he's saying this is our conversation, or if he's, he's already had the conversation, conversation with Peter and now he's kind of kind of uh, elaborating on what he was saying. It's hard to know who he's talking to. But he says, we who are Jews. He was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles. You can almost hear the sarcasm. Because I think that phrase was actually probably one of the slogans that the Judaizers used. You see... The pride that a statement like that displays is at the heart of their issue. They really did believe that they were superior. Even if you were, if somebody else as a Gentile comes to believe in Jesus, well, that's great. You might be in the faith, but I'm still like way up here and you're way down there. They really wanted to continue to feel superior to Gentiles. And this little phrase captures it. So Paul's using it against them. He says, so we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, we know, we even know that a person is not, verse 16, not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we, we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. What he's saying is, wait a minute, even those of us who are law-abiding Jews and not sinful Gentiles, we still know this, that you can't be justified by obeying the law. He says, even we know. He says, stop pretending. Stop giving in to this. You see, we've put our faith in Christ because the law doesn't justify. Verse 17, he says, but if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? See, now here's this other question that the Judaizers were saying that if Paul is trying to kind of basically cancel out the law, repeal the law, that it's going to promote sin. This is kind of hard logic to follow. I'm going to try to explain it to us. But how in the world could they say, that if Paul is preaching right, then, then somehow Christ is promoting sin or really increasing the numbers of sinners. And I think maybe it goes like this. The Judaizers were thinking, look, under the Old Testament way, the Jews were righteous, Gentiles were sinners. Now under this new gospel, apparently everyone is a sinner. He says, so see, now everybody's sinning. And Paul's response is, yeah, no. The law of Moses never justified anyone. It only showed that we were sinners. And to return to trying to be justified by the law after hearing the gospel of grace through faith in Christ, we, he says basically, then that really would be sinning. He says, verse 19, he says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. What Paul's saying is, no, don't you see? Now everything works. The law sentenced me to death, and once I was declared dead, I'm free from the, from the requirements of the law. There are other passages where we see the same thing. You can't, you can't bring judgment upon when somebody is dead. You owe a debt, and then they send in your death certificate. Okay, they don't get their money, okay? What, being dead meant you were free from the requirements of the law. So it's right about here that Paul then, as a part of this conversation, uh, writes out probably the most famous passage in the book of Galatians. 
And it's in this context of it's not, never was the law. But when the law does what it's supposed to do and brings a verdict of death, then I'm dead and I'm free from the law. It's Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. You get the point? If you can be good enough, if you can obey God's law and be justified, then why would Jesus die? This passage, Galatians 2.20, it's a declaration about both how we are saved and how we are to live. It was our sin that sent Jesus to the cross, and it was his love that held him there. The great exchange is that he gave his life for us so that now the lives that we live are his. It's like the person who lives because they've received a transplanted organ. Okay, even though they're continuing to live, the person who gave that organ, in a sense, is living too. They live on. But you see, Jesus is actually still alive. He came back from the dead. I can't, I don't know how to be articulate enough to help us understand how important this passage is. You see, there's a big difference between realizing, oh, on the cross, Jesus was crucified for me. And, oh, on that cross, I am crucified with him. You see, the first way, Christ, he was crucified for me, that's what brings us deliverance from God, from sin's condemnation. But I am crucified with him, that's when we start to experience freedom from sin's power now. In Romans 6.11, Paul says something very similar. He says, In the same way, count yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You know, as I think about this, I'm wondering if maybe uh, many of the struggles that we as followers of Jesus face, you know, not being really all that good at following Jesus, maybe that would be remedied if we lived like someone who has been crucified. T.S. Randall, commentator, he wrote this. He said, too many Christians are trying to face in two directions at the same time. They are divided in heart. They want heaven, but they also want to love the world. He wrote, they're like Lot's wife, running one direction but facing the other. Remember, a crucified man only faces one direction. He can't look back. He's not going to go back to his old life. And he has no plans of his own. That's the power of a crucified life. Most of us are happy to say, Jesus died for me. You know what I don't hear many Christians saying? And I died with him. And yet, the sins that are besetting you, the habits, the hurts, the hang-ups, the things that make you hang your head in shame, the things that make you feel far from God, the things that make you know you've disappointed others, and that you're not living up to what Jesus saved you for, all those things are connected to another life. You were crucified with Him. And now as you live, you don't have to live that life. You see, he lives in you. This will revolutionize your life living with Christ. And so, to close out the message, I'm going to invite you to do something that's going to be kind of strange. Some of you are at the watch party. Uh, some of you are in your home. But I'm going to ask you to do something. Ready? I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. Go ahead. Please, stand up. Yeah, at the watch party. Stand up.
at home. Stand up. And now, I want you to read this passage with me out loud, nice and slow. And let the Spirit of God apply these things to your heart. Let's read. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. May that truth be lived out in our lives. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, if I'm honest, when I have struggled following you, it's because I have forgotten this principle. Oh, the first part I never forget. Jesus died for me. But how quickly I forget that I died with you. So that I can be free from the law and that the life that I'm living now, I live by faith in you. It is what I want so why do I forget that truth? Lord, would you help us to mull that phrase over in our mind every day, multiple times a day this week. I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. May that affect when I'm tempted to be short-tempered. May that help when I'm tempted to be depressed or discouraged. May it help when I'm tempted to be self-centered rather than others-centered. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Make that true in us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, join me reading the book. Send me a note. Let me know you're doing that. And remember, you've been crucified with Christ. You don't live. Christ lives in you. Have a great week. Bye-bye. We're gonna dance. We're gonna sing. We're gonna get real loud. Let our voices ring. We're gonna party. We're having fun with Jesus Christ. Hey, Dot. What's going on? See that guy running away from the security guards? Yes. That's the dad from Home Plate. What's Home Plate? Only one of the most heartwarming sitcoms of the 1980s. I used to think this guy was the perfect dad. Now he's just some guy who snuck into the zoo in his pajamas, tried to high five a penguin, and has spent the last half hour running from security in a golf cart. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You lost me. Here, I will explain the whole thing. <sighs> Who is hammering? Me. I finally put up my wall calendar. But it's December. The year's practically over. Better late than never. Spruces up the wall, don't you think? Uh, it says that it's Wednesday, December 2nd, but it's Friday the 2nd. Don't use it for the dates. I've had that calendar for years. I just like the pictures. But that defeats the whole purpose of a calendar. You can't reuse last year's with this year's. You sound like Maurice. Dot, you can't use a salami like a hammer. But 
Here we are. Hungry? We are Connect HQ. Every day we help the people of the world live God's way. We look for the links, make the connection, and you never know what might happen. My name is Dot, and this is the time I found the perfect dad. And even though you drove a hot dog cart into the front of our restaurant and caused lasting damage to the building's foundation, <laughs> you'll always be my number one slugger. You mean it, Dad? You'll never strike out with me. Aww. Man, when is life going to stop, stop throwing me curveballs? Curve curve what you watching, Doc? <laughs> I've found tons of episodes from a classic sitcom from the 80s called Home Plate. Hmm. Is that the one about the baseball pitcher who retires to open up a restaurant and raises three crazy kids? Yep. The dad on this show is perfect. He's a chef, a sports hero, and a hilarious dad. He's unreal! That's the best word for it. He's just a character on a show. My dad is a good dad, but he's nothing like this guy. That's because it's not real. It's just a made-up situation. I know. But maybe it could be. Could be what? Huh? Well, you said maybe it could be, and then you trailed off like you were thinking of some wacky idea. You know, life is not a sitcom. I know, but maybe it could be. See, you just did it again. Huh? Okay, Dot, I think you're all wired up and ready to go. The sound should be working in every room. Here's the remote. Thanks. What's this button that says, Maurice? Please press that any time that I enter a room. Got it. So, what's all this for, anyways? I'm proving to Luke that with the right formula, it's possible to create the perfect dad. Just like you see on TV. That would be nice. What was your dad like when you were growing up? Invisible. You had an invisible dad? I mean, he wasn't home very much. He traveled a lot. But that was my dad on Earth. You also had an alien dad? <laughs> no, I, I just mean, when I chose to follow Jesus, God became my dad. And he is the best dad. I can talk to him anytime that I need to, and he always knows how to meet my needs. But don't you wish you had the perfect dad here on Earth? No matter what kind of dad I have on earth, I can always say this. I am accepted and loved, a child of God above. I am accepted and loved, a child of God above. Good luck with your experiment, but don't forget what I said. Well, I still think it's possible to create a perfect earth dad. <laughs> And even though you rented a pony without my permission, and I'll probably be floundering in financial debt for the rest of my life, you're still my little home run. I love you, Dad. Man, when is life gonna stop throwing me curveballs? See, this just seems cheesy. Dot needs to see an example of a real dad. Hmm. What about the dad that God trusted with his own son? This is the story about the God who loves us in the Bible. We find truth and purpose to love God and love others. We're searching God's word for things to discover. This book is alive, full of answers and godly advice. This book is alive. is alive.
When God sent his son Jesus, he placed him in a very unusual family. That's because his mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before they were married, Joseph discovered that she was going to have a baby. Joseph wasn't sure what he should do. He knew he wasn't the father of Mary's baby. Still, he loved Mary and didn't want others to harm her or think badly of her. While Joseph was trying to figure out what to do, he had a dream. In his dream, an angel told Joseph to take Mary as his wife because the baby she carried was God's son and Joseph would be Jesus' adopted father. It was all part of God's plan. When Joseph woke up, he did exactly what the angel said. He married Mary and together they got ready to bring God's son into the world. After Jesus was born, Joseph had another dream. An angel appeared again telling Joseph to take Mary and Jesus to Egypt. The angel said the evil King Herod was looking for Jesus, and if the king found Jesus, he would kill him. Joseph was a good father to Jesus. After all, he had adopted Jesus as his own. So he took his family to Egypt to protect Jesus and his mother from the evil King Herod. And when the angel appeared again to tell Joseph the evil king was dead and the coast was clear, Joseph took Jesus and Mary to Nazareth. He took his wife and adopted son home. Joseph was a carpenter. He built things out of wood. And as Jesus grew up, Joseph taught Jesus how to be a carpenter too. Even though Joseph knew Jesus was God's son, he raised Jesus as his very own. He became the father of the Son of God, and it was all part of God's plan. All of this is very important because the Bible tells us that when God sent Jesus, he made a way for us to be adopted into his family. God made a way for us to become his very own children. And when God adopts us, we don't just become like his children, and he doesn't just become like our father. He becomes our real heavenly father, and we really become his children. So when you think of Christmas, think of Joseph, the adoptive father of Jesus. And remember how when God sent Jesus, he made a way to adopt us and make us his very own. When Dot sees this Bible story, she'll see that just like Jesus, God is our dad. When we choose to follow Jesus, God adopts us as his sons and daughters. That's better than any fake sitcom, Dad. What is that smell? Whew. Not my socks this time. Something burning? That box just move? <laughs> Who is laughing at me? It's a smoke. Smoke, 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 smoke. smoke. <laughs> going on? Well, you know how you said I couldn't get a pet? I never said that. While you were making muffins, I hatched a crazy scheme to sneak a pet and a Connect HQ and a Christmas present. I didn't make muffins. Wait, there's a live animal in there. <laughs> what is that noise? You'll have to ask Maurice about that. Did somebody say Maurice? Oh, stop pressing buttons. I can't think straight. <coughs> Dot, whatever is in that box sounds like a squirrel. Bingo! Needs to be taken back outside. But shouldn't you sit me down and have a heart to heart with me before you say a catchphrase? I don't have a catchphrase. Don't you have a cooking or baseball related life lesson you should share with me first? Here's a life lesson for you you can't put a squirrel inside a box. Technically, you can, but you shouldn't. Come on, Nutty. I guess we're not wanted in here. <laughs> Awkward. Even though you set off a glitter bomb in our living room. <sighs> Man, 
When is life going to stop throwing me curveballs? Are there any squirrels in here? Nope. What about invisible audiences? All gone. I know, I know, you don't have to tell me. My perfect dad plan didn't work. Why is it such a big deal for you to create the perfect dad? I was watching the show and thinking of all the different families we come from. Some of us have bad dads or stepdads or adoptive dads or no dads. Think of all the different kids we could help if we figured out the formula for the perfect dad. Well, there is no formula. Most dads aren't perfect like the ones that we see on TV or read about, and that is okay. Because God gave us a way to be His children, just like it says in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 5. You want to say it with me? Sure! Okay. Ephesians 1, 5. Ephesians 1, 5. So He decided long ago. So He decided long ago. To adopt us as His children. To adopt us as His children. He did it because of what? Jesus Christ has done. He did it because of what Jesus Christ has done. God sent Jesus to show us His love and die on a cross to take the punishments for our sins. When we believe in that and choose to follow Jesus, we are adopted immediately as sons and daughters of God. And God becomes our dad. Uh, he may not be the sports star or chef, but he's better. Well, he knows our needs and he meets them. He's a great father. Now, where is that remote? Why? Well, you had a pretty solid heart to heart. I think that calls for some applause. I'll give it to you on one condition. You have to say a catchphrase first. Okay, uh, 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 uh how about, uh, you're safe at home. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> try, try that one. All right. <laughs> How long are we supposed to stay frozen like this? Do the credits. Hi, my name is Luke. And we found an answer for you. The Bible tells us this in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 5. So he decided long ago to adopt us as his children. He did it because of what Jesus Christ has done. God loves you. And even before this world was created, he chose you to be his child. That's why he sent his son, Jesus, to earth so that we could follow Jesus and become adopted sons and daughters of God. Jesus had a dad on earth named Joseph to take care of him, teach him and be there for him while he was here on earth. If you have a dad you know, or one you don't, God adopts you and he is your real dad. He takes care of you and treats you as his very own child. You may have an idea of what the perfect dad should be like, but God is the best dad. You can spend time with him, talk to Him, and trust Him to take care of anything you need. When we get to know God as our dad, we are accepted and loved, no matter what. That's because He sees us as His precious and loved children. No matter what type of dad you may have here on earth, you can say, I am accepted and loved, a child of God above. I hope that helps. And just remember, Connect HQ is here to help you. Looks like the home plate dad isn't as perfect as the character he played on TV. No kidding. I thought he was loving and patient and good, but I couldn't have been further from the truth. Are you disappointed? Maybe a little, but Luke helped me realize that no dad will ever care for me as perfectly as God does. God really is the best dad we could ask for. Did the home plate dad just fall into the chimpanzee pit? I'm afraid to see what happens next.
heard of Connect is when we connect to God by singing Him a song. And you know my favorite season to sing to God? Christmas time! Christmas is all about the gift that God gave the world, His only Son, Jesus. You know something that we could get Jesus for a Christmas present? We can sing and dance with all of our attention. So come on, get up and let's sing some Christmas songs together.
But a friend who faced the cross to set us free You are with us You are with us In every moment You are with us You are Jesus You are Jesus The word you bring the dead to life again You were there from the beginning of creation With a promise to be with us in the end You are with us You are with us In every moment, you are with me. 
Well, they finally caught the home plate, Dad. They found him asleep next to a baby camel at the petting zoo. I want a baby camel. None of our earthly dads are perfect. They all make mistakes. But God will never let us down, and He wants to be your heavenly dad. If you want to make the choice to follow Jesus, you can do that right now. All you have to remember are the ABCs. A. Admit. Admit that you've done wrong and ask God to forgive you for disobeying Him. B. Believe. Believe God sent Jesus to take the punishment for your sin. Trust that you are forgiven because Jesus made you right with God. C. Choose. Choose to spend your whole life depending on God's power to help you say no to sin. As you live and love like Jesus, tell others God is your leader and number one friend. If you want to make that choice today, be sure to talk about it with a parent or a leader you trust.